Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on InRange TV. Today I have a box of mystery ammo. Green tip 762 NATO. Green tip, that's M855. Yep. Oh wait, that's three. Oh, this is 308. This is like the opposite of M855. It is. This is M it's actually a T1 T314E3, aka M198 duplex ball ammo. Duplex ball, so that means that it's got two projectiles. Two bullet. Two bullets. One case. Two bullet. So you pull the trigger and you get two rounds, well, not two rounds, two projectiles Two projectiles downrange. Down uh, this is a pair of 83 grain, actually solid steel copper jacket. Wait, 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 the bullets are solid steel with a copper jacket. Yep. Okay. And so 83 grains, you're doing 166 combined grains of projectile through the through the round. Yep. At okay. like 25, 2600 feet per second. Okay. So pretty close to 168 or 172 grain, which is 308. Exactly. It basically duplicates, as far as the rifle knows, this mm -hmm. duplicates M80 ball. So now is this reproduction ammo or is this nope. the real thing? This is original, made in 1964. Okay. Uh, this originally, the idea came out of the Salvo 1 and Salvo 2 tests hmm. in 1956 and 57, where the U.S., uh, the the government was trying to come up with a way to improve hit percentage. You know, that's always been a problem in all militaries, is that there's just not enough training and marksmanship in any military, exactly. American or otherwise, to get the hit ratio you actually want per round fired. Yep. You know, the NRA originally was designed post-Civil War, not as a political organization, but to increase the marksmanship of the Northerners who couldn't hit anything. Right. So these guys are probably blasting a lot of rounds downrange at, 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 at Viet Cong right. and not getting that many hits. Exactly. Okay. Now, Salvo was taking place before Vietnam. Mm -hmm. um, but what they found was that your marksmanship wasn't really the most important factor in making mm -hmm. a hit or not. The factor was how long is the target exposed and how big is the exposed section. That's a very good point. Shitty marksman could still make a hit on a big target up close that he could see well. True. Great marksman, if he sees a little flip of a, a silhouette, he's not going to hit it. So they tested a number of solutions. They tested shotgun shells full of flechettes. Mm. They tested uh, you know, rapid burst firing guns. So a higher rate of fire. Yep. Okay. And they tested multiple bullets. You know, it's funny when you see the rapid rate of fire, you see that with some of the Russian designs going on, like the yeah. AN-94. Absolutely. They're trying to increase, they're not trying to make duplex rounds. What they're trying to do is just increase the rate of fire to be so fast that you have a bitter, better chance of hit probability with one, one pull of the trigger. Exactly. Yeah. This stuff's still going on. In the 90s, this was still going on with the HK G11. Okay. So what they came up with out of Salvo was the most effective... The, the most cost effective and the best overall solution was a duplex bullet. They did actually try triplex. Oh, and wow. I think I've seen pictures of even a four bullet. Jeez. Yeah. Okay. The thing with duplex was uh, you've got better ballistics because your bullets are light, but think about dividing 165 grains three ways. You're getting like 32 ACP projectiles. Yeah. This is a little bit better than that, and this can be done without modifying the firearm at all. Just so put it in the magazine, chamber it, and fire it. Right. When you get three bullets, now you have to have a longer case neck to support the front bullet. Does it modify the zero? I have no idea. So that's the thing. I have not found any information on people actually shooting this stuff. Yeah. How, what is the dispersion? So how does the dispersion happen? So if you've got two projectiles right next yeah. to each other, what makes them do something separate? Well, the front projectile, they're not quite identical. Okay. The front projectile actually has a, uh, a recess in its base that the back projectile noses into. So it's kind of like that. Yeah, hollow base bullet, okay. basically. Got it. And then the rear bullet has a flat base but it's not perfectly parallel, it's actually angled slightly. Interesting. And that angle was there, in theory, to force dispersion. Now, I would think that as that second projectile is leaving the barrel, as the gas is venting behind it, that little angle actually acts to push on it and cause it to turn? Maybe? That's my thinking. That so if, you have, sense, a, if yeah. you have an angle on the back and the gas hits it, it's gonna kind of yeah. make it do something. Yeah. So do you know at what distances they actually start seeing dispersion? No clue whatsoever. No that clue whatsoever. is why we're out here today. That's what we're going to test. Now, one other thing that came to mind, though, you said this yeah. is an 83 gram bullet at 25 something? Yeah. That sounds like it's going to have a, a deficient deficiency in terminal ballistics. Probably. Unless you get both hits on the target. Probably, but I think the idea was any hit on target is good enough. Well, that's certainly, you know, any hit on target is better than no hit on target. Right. So, so what are we going to do out here today? So we have a big cardboard target out there, currently at 25 meters. It's okay. uh, two terrorist bad dudes. Yep. I've got a green tape X right in the middle. Okay. So I'm going to be shooting at it with my Spur Brethren Arms left-handed G3. And that thing is currently zero to hit exactly dead on. It, it has a range. perfect zero. Well, I mean, it's... you could shoot the center of that X. Yeah. So if you don't hit the center of that X with this, it means that there was a zero differentiation. Right. And so I don't know if this is how this will change the zero. So we'll find that out. And I don't know what the dispersion is going to be. I honestly don't know whether to expect one oval hole at 25 yards or 12 inches apart. This is really interesting. And I can't find any sources online from anyone who's ever actually tried it. Well, in range so, is bringing it to the table. Absolutely. Now, once we do 25 yards, we're going to, assuming we have 
not too much dispersion. We're going to step stepping the target back. Mm -hmm. In theory, maybe as far as 150 or 200. If we can do it and just see what happens. All right, let's, well, let's do start it. with this 25 meters. All right, 25 yards. I have three rounds in the mag because I'm also curious to see if this cycles the gun. It should. Here we go. And safety. Let's go take a look. All right, so 25 meters, you aimed where? Right here? Right about there. All right, so the zero is a little different. A little bit. Now, this was offhand. It wasn't a perfect shot. For zero, I was like, you know, is it going to be up here, over here? That's what I was really looking at. This is, you know, the next round we'll do prone, and I'll hold it dead on and make a, a more careful shot. Now, I'm surprised to see we already have quite a bit of, of separation. Two In fact, and a quarter, two and a half inches? Two and a half inches. So at 25 meters, 25 yards close enough, you got a two and a half inch dispersion out of this duplex round. Now, I think that's pretty freaking cool. I was going to say, if you were a rifleman, though, at that distance, one shot would have been as good as two. This is not increasing your hit probability, is it? Uh, probably not so much. Not at this distance. Yeah. But, man, you've got two wound channels now. This is kind of interesting. Yeah. All right. So, uh, what do you think? 50 or 100? Let's go to 50 and do prone. All right. Next shot, 50. And if it stays consistent, this should become what? Five? Yep. Let's find out. cycled again let's go take a look all right so here we are at 50 meters still on target this was a much better more careful shot right there and we're a little bit high i would say you're just getting an elevation change not really yeah. windage change that's yeah and we got a hit there and a hit there what are we looking at three and a quarter not quite double what you got at 25 all right so we're not going double each time so now let's go to 100 yeah and see what we get absolutely i'm sure there's plenty of variation in in the dispersion? Well, I suspect there is. I guess I shouldn't say anything at this point. Three and a quarter, straight up three and a quarter. So we went from two and a half to three and a quarter by going another 25 meters. This is absolutely doubling. I mean, those are two wound channels and that could have increased your chances of getting a hit, especially if you got a fringe hit. Right. Maybe one would go by and one would get a hit. Exactly. This kind of looks like this is actually turning out to be a thing. That's the idea. Let's All right, let's try a hundred. hundred. Let's go take a look at that one. Now things are starting to spread out. Now we're seeing something legit. We got one there, which was the point of aim. Yeah, and one there. Wow, is that a foot? 10 inches, 10 inches, all right. 10 inches at 100 meters. Now, all right, some people are gonna look at this and go, oh, now it's worthless. Actually, I think exactly the opposite. Now that we've got this much dispersion, now this stuff is actually at a point where it can do what it's intended to do. Well, let's think about this. We went from two and a half to three and a quarter to 10 inches. So at 200, it's probably gonna be quite a bit. Right. At, <laughs> at two, it might be, I could aim here yeah. and get one miss and one hit. This yeah. appears to be what it said it would do. Let's go ahead and get up and let's have a conclusion about this. Okay. All right, could it actually be that this actually does what it says it does? I think it does. I think we pretty well just showed that it does. You know, I think past 100, you start actually deprecating the capabilities of an actual marksman but you increase the capabilities of an average soldier firing at something in the distance that he just noticed and dumping a couple rounds. Exactly. Which is Even, what they were trying to do. You know what? Even a marksman. Yeah, that's true. I think, because you're, this isn't about shooting a bullseye. This is about shooting a fleeting, moving target. This is so much different than the standard American concept of one shot, one kill. Think about it this way. What if you see a guy go whoop, behind a bush? Yeah. Put one or two rounds of this in. You've got twice that's a situation where it doesn't matter what your fundamental marksmanship capability is. You don't know where the guy is in that bush. Yeah. You can fire one round and have one random chance to hit. You can fire one of these and have two random chances to hit. I would say, though, that you did hit the point of aim with one of the two projectiles, meaning that you That's did, true. aiming mattered. Yeah. It wasn't just spray and pray. But the reality is, with a 10-inch dispersion, let's say there was two guys next to each other, you might have got both of them. We came real close to getting both of these guys on this shot. Came close. Or if the guy's moving, you have if he was going to the left, that one round that went 10 inches to the left, even though you didn't lead him, you would have had a chance of getting him with that one round. Yep. Or that one projectile. Let me say that properly. I think some people are going to look at this and talk about, like, yeah, they're dead. Just, just let them keel over. They died. I think some people are going to look at this and start coming up with plans about, like, well, you know one's point of aim and one's high and to the left, so you plant. The point of this is when you're not able to pull the trigger on a perfect shot in the first place. It kind of gives you a rifle. It kind of gives the rifleman, I know this is not a fair analogy, but it kind of gives the rifleman a beat zone. 
Exactly. That is that is the purpose. Pop, 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 yeah. And then a whole bunch of rounds go into the general area, and the, the probability of a hit on anything in that area is much greater. Yep. So there are a couple reasons. Yeah, these guys are tops. They're toast. So there are a couple reasons why this stuff didn't ever go into service. Well, it did. Yeah. You said it was in service. Uh, true. true. It didn't get it formally adopted and kept. Right. Okay. So there's a reason they didn't stick with it. Fair. Um, and in fact, the, the amount that went into service was basically large-scale troop trials. Fair. You know, two million rounds of ammunition sounds like a lot until you've got guys dumping it in belts through M60s, and then it goes kind of fast. Sure. Um, Ooh, and an M60, man, is that. You're doubling, you're not increasing the rate of fire, but you're doubling the amount of rounds down, projectiles downrange. Yeah. Yeah. So there are a couple, from what I can tell, official definitive reasons this got dropped. Okay. And probably the biggest one is cost. Um, oh. This is substantially more complicated to manufacture than standard ball. You've got two different bullets, because they're not the same bullets. So you have to make, you know, You've got to double up your machinery for the bullets. And they're unique, like you said. And then being a, the, the process for actually seeding bullets, two of them, properly in one case, is a lot more complex than one round of M80. It is. Um, so it was a lot more expensive to make. Uh, and I, by the time they were ready, like had data back and were ready to make a decision, the Vietnam War was kind of rolling down. And yeah. it's like, do we, is, it, is it worth, are we getting enough benefit from this that it's worth the extra cost? Especially now, we're trying to trying to reduce our our involvement here. I suspect at the same time, and this isn't written down anywhere, but it, I think it makes a lot of good sense. There was a lot of resistance to this from the old school military brass because how on earth are you supposed to shoot at Camp Perry with that? Oh, <laughs> that doesn't work exactly. Right. And you so know. much of the American rifle doctrine is actually even military doctrine is based on competitive shooting. Yeah. It really yeah. is. And, and in the U.S. in particular, we have this tradition and history and mythos of the individual marksman, one shot, one kill. Um, this flies directly in the face right. of it. This is very insulting to that idea. The idea that your accuracy is fine, but we're actually better with random chance than we are with your marksmanship. Which, when you That's... think about what the Soviets did with the AK and making it a submachine gun, they were kind of in that path. Kind you know, the, the Soviet yeah. doctrine was to run in full auto and do short controlled bursts, which is not an individual round, but the chance is a hit probability goes up with a couple rounds downrange. We're right. doing this with individual projectiles with a duplex load. Yeah. I think when you think about in terms of combat efficiency, this makes a lot of sense. I think it does. Now, I suspect there was also an issue with ballistic effectiveness, mm -hmm. probably especially in machine guns, where they're shooting deliberately at longer ranges. Sure. Because you've only got a little stubby 83 grain bullet. It's not gonna. It's not gonna do so well at long range. Well, like our little stubby 62 grain bullets we're shooting now. You mean? Well, yes, but those have a much better BC. They do because they're designed to be specifically designed for the ballistic coefficient. These are weird projectiles that have a. Yeah. yeah fair enough. These are very inefficient projectiles. The other thing I would say to that is that with the transition from 308 to an intermediate cartridge, 5.56, five, hmm. duplexing a 5.56 five, and having two 31 yeah. round bullets makes no sense at all. You really have to be 30 caliber or above to have this make any sense. Yeah, I agree. So that's another thing that might have been, you know, a death kneel here as well. When you yeah. talk about the 60s, that's when that started really, really happening. That's a good point. Yeah, I wasn't thinking about that. Yeah, so I think that's part of it. Yeah. Wow, this is fascinating though. So I'm thrilled. This went, as I, I didn't imagine it would go anywhere near this well. So we, we started implementing buck and ball in Vietnam. <laughs> I know. Ball and ball. Yeah, ball and ball. I, I'm really impressed. This legitimately does perform as it said it would. And I really do think that this would improve your capability of a hit in the field. Yeah, I like it. Fascinating. Cool. Yeah. Hey, guys, you like this kind of stuff. Hopefully, this is really the only kind of stuff you find on in-range. I haven't, like I said at the beginning, I can't find any actual data on people using this stuff anywhere. So. We had to do it ourselves. Now there's some. Yes. If you like this kind of stuff, please consider supporting us on Patreon. This is not cheap. Uh, no, that is about 20 bucks a round. Okay, so, so you just saw a lot of money go downrange. Yeah. And it's because of Patreon that we're able to do that. It's you guys that support us financially that makes that happen because we have advertising money from nowhere. Nobody. We are not centrally, we are distributed. We are not centralized on YouTube. We're on multiple different distribution networks. You can find us all on inrange.tv. Your Patreon support keeps us alive. If you can't do that, please subscribe and share with your friends. Thanks for watching.